another edition of Liberty with Love. My name is Robin Kerner. It is a pleasure to have you with me. And I'm really excited about this show. I've been doing this for, what, two or three years now? And uh, so I get to, you know, look at a lot of the stuff that my guests do before I speak to them. And my guest today is a gentleman called Gret Glyer. And uh, by the end of the show, you're going to want to go onto YouTube and check out the amazing work he's doing and the amazing videos he's put on YouTube describing the work he's doing. Um, looking at his work, that was, some, it was, was, it was really inspiring for me. And so I got him on the show because I want you to be inspired by what he's doing. And I want you maybe to contribute to humanity in the manner that he has enabled you to do so in a very exciting way. Um, Gret, welcome to Liberty with Love. Thanks for being with me. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Robin. So now you have spent, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, Do it. Yeah, you have, great. you have spent a lot of your time in Malawi. Now, I was going to say a lot of your life in Malawi, but you're quite a young man, right? You look quite a young yeah. man. How old are you? Can I, I ask am, you? Yeah. Uh, I just turned 27. Okay. <laughs> so what you have achieved at 27 <laughs> is just wonderful. Um, now, what it, when did you first go to Malawi? What took you there? And if you don't mind, tell us the story of how your first visit or visits to Malawi got you to do the thing that we're obviously going to talk about in this show. Right. So, sounds good. So I, I graduated from my college back in 2012, and I started immediately working at a, a rental car company on like this management track. And I, it was one of those standard corporate nine to five jobs. And I didn't enjoy it very much, and I spent a year doing it, and I was very successful. I, you know, we had to sell things, and I did a good job of selling things, and we had to manage our organization. I did a good job of that, and we were ranked really highly in our region. Despite all of the success, I was just like very unhappy, I, and I didn't want to be really good at renting cars, you know, 20 years down the road. So I started looking at different opportunities, and eventually I came up with the the opportunity to go over to Malawi, Africa, and teach math uh, as a high school teacher just fell into my lap and when it fell into my lap I bought the ticket I quit my job I got my shots I got all of the medication you need and I moved in I heard about the opportunity on in August uh, August 13th 2013 I was on a plane uh, the very next month uh, of this of the same year so I like your one month. I like your style Gret. I love it um, yeah. just because there's no reason why any of my listeners would know much about Malawi just give us a few facts about Malawi just the basics well it, in 2014, it was ranked as the poorest country in the entire world. Uh, I would say that they had a massive government scandal back in 2000. I think it was 2014 as well, where the local government was stealing billions of the of kwacha, which is a local currency. They were stealing billions of, of dollars from the local citizens. People didn't realize it. And it equated to about $30 million that they were stealing. But when that was uncovered, it was enough to completely cripple the local economy. $30 million is like one department. It's like one, one corner of one department in most first world countries. In Malawi, that was like crippling the entire economy. Um, and then, I mean, there's the the majority of the people in that country. It's 15 million people live in that country. Um, about 10 million of them are living in these like rural, dusty villages, no electricity, no running water, and they're living on roughly a dollar a day. So, yeah, those are some facts about Malawi. So carry on. I kind of interrupted your story with that question. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so you get on this plane to Malawi to, to teach uh -huh. math. And um, what happens? Yes. Yeah, so I, I got on, on the plane, and my expectation was when you think of Africa, you think of like lions, and you think of these dusty villages, and you think of grass thatch huts, you think of all this stuff. And so I got on the plane, and on the plane, I think to myself, this is like this morning I took my last hot shower for a year, and I'm going to get <laughs> over there, and I'm, I'm going to have no amenities whatsoever. And then I land, and I have Wi Fi, and I have hot showers. And the, the weirdest thing about the whole experience was I actually, I had. A, I had a cook. I had a guy who like came to my house every day and like he would – I lived with a bunch of other American guys and he would clean our house. He would uh, cook for us and do our laundry and a whole bunch of other – and it was, it was just like a weird experience because mm -hmm. um, in some ways like my life over there ended up being nicer than my life back in, the, in America. Um, mm. So yeah, that that was how I originally got over there. I, I went. I just wanted to get to Africa. Something inside of me just had to get over to Africa and then once I was over there, I was teaching and I – 
I from there transitioned into poverty alleviation. Okay, so I'm just interested. So this situation that you kind of flew into, literally, uh, yeah. those resources that you were enjoying, you know, your hot showers and the cook, uh, who, was suppli- who, who or what was supplying those amenities? What was the organization? Yeah, so- what was the... Oh, for sure. Yeah, this is something that people are always asking about because it's hard to find like a good solid place to go over there. So my, the particular one I went with was called African Bible Colleges. And um, you can go over there and either be like a, a professor if you have the credentials for that, or you can just go and teach. At, they have like a kindergarten, a K through 12 school over there. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I was partic- I was signed up because they didn't have a math teacher for their high school and like last minute they just needed anyone <laughs> like I wasn't I wasn't qualified at all but they just needed anyone and I was like I'll teach math if you let me come over there I will teach math I'll figure it out and now yeah. what about the language situation though Gret? yeah so I was teaching so that was the thing I was the the K through 12 was like international it was an international school so oh, I was teaching Americans who had their who were doing work over there and their kids were going to the okay. school or it was upper class Malawians who were having their kids go to the school. It. it was about 50. Yeah. Now it all makes sense. Okay, yeah. So you carry yeah, on. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, it would be very tough otherwise. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in, Mal- in, in Malawi, the, the, the language is uh, the official written language is English. So, but you go into a village and, and they speak a whole bunch of different mm. dialects. Mm. Um, so, yeah, my first year over there, I'm a teacher and I'm teaching math and I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time. And like on the weekends, I'm going out to these like remote villages and I'm meeting people and doing all sorts of different stuff. And over time, I realized like my heart, like the thing I want to do with my entire life that that year is when I realized I just want to help people living in extreme poverty. That's like that is the thing in my life that I want to spend. I want to spend the whole thing doing it. Um, so after about a year and a half, I, I ended up spending three years in Malawi total. And after about a year and a half, I quit. Uh, teaching and I transitioned into full-time poverty alleviation work and we did everything you can imagine we built houses for orphans and widows we uh, put mosquito nets in like we we did fundraisers to put mosquito nets in every single house in an entire village because when you do that you drop the malaria rate in that village by 90 percent or we the the very last thing I did was we we built a 100 we crowdfunded a one hundred thousand dollar girls school so there's 120 girls in malawi uh, going to this girls school right now so all, all of these things were, were the things that we worked on um throughout the year and that like that girls school was kind of the capstone before i left now you we've only got like three minutes left in uh this first segment uh you told a story um in a lecture that you gave to your alma mater about yeah. meeting a very poor woman being introduced to a very poor woman in a village in malawi yeah. and and i it sounded to me when i was listening to your lecture that that was kind of if I can say formative for you or kind of, it was an important moment in, in your life, I suppose. Would, would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah. It was formative for a number of reasons. There were the, in the lecture, I talked about how I, I met this lady, the, the first time I ever got taken out to a village and like was introduced mm. to people living in these rural conditions that was, you know, I was living in like the, the nice shower air condition areas, but then I, I was, I was taken to, to these places. There's no electricity. There's like naked kids running around playing in the mud. There's like people cooking on like a fire on the ground. Like they don't have a kitchen. They just have like sticks on the ground that they're using to cook their food. And um, I, as I was walking through this village, I met. I did meet this lady. Her name was Rosina. And if if you saw a picture of her, she's like skin and bones. She had not eaten in a single in a whole week. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things about her backstory but it's a very sad situation where she was a victim of a lot of abuse and she's 70 years old i mean it was like it was like how much more vulnerable and frail can mm. a ver- person get and when i met her uh my friend blessings told me that she needed a house and as someone who lives in america you know the houses around me cost something like half a million dollars you something like i don't know exactly the amounts but they're they're not cheap and I, and when blessings when i was told that this lady rosina needs a house i was thinking like how do i provide a house for this for this lady like i don't have the means to do that so i asked him how much is it gonna is it gonna cost to build her a house and he's like well it's really expensive it's gonna cost 800 bucks and i mean my jaw's on the floor at that point and i'm thinking my last ipad cost 800 dollars. my tv probably cost more than 800 bucks and 800 dollars to provide to give this lady a home that she's living in mm. today right now mm. um so yeah doing that was was a formative thing and then like the other thing i didn't mention in that story was my my mom she came out to visit me uh-huh. in Malawi a few months later, and my mom came, and she met Rosina, shook hands with her. The, a translator came, and the two of them were having this interaction, and that was so 
when I saw the connection between those two, I was like, I want to make this connection for everyone on Earth. That's what I want to do. I love it. Now, this is good timing because we're coming up to uh, the end of the first segment, to the first break. So I guess when we come back, we'll talk about what you've done. It's an incredible thing you've done to help make those connections and improve the lives of hopefully uh, lots of people going forward. This is Liberty with Love. My name is Robin Kerner. I'm talking to Gret Glyer, uh, absolutely fantastic man. We'll be back. <laughs> This is Liberty with Love. My name is Robin Kerner. I am speaking to Gret Glyer. Gret, when we went into that first break, uh, you told an amazing story about you meeting this frail lady in Malawi. um, And you saw your mother, uh, when she came later, uh, speak to, communicate with this lady whose life you had changed immeasurably um, by providing a home and well, we may, we may talk more about how you did that. Um, and you decided you wanted to make, I guess, connections among people in very, with very different kinds of existences, right, around the world, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit more about that. And obviously what I'm really excited to get to is what you have done to mm-hmm. enable this to happen. Sure. So one of the things that is kind of, is kind of mind blowing and it's really hard to comprehend. I use the analogy of a fishbowl. So a lot of times you're looking around at the other people in your life and that creates a fishbowl for, or even the people that you see on TV. And you start thinking, Oh, the world kind of looks like this, like, like this, this is the makeup of the world. There's some British people. There's some, uh, American people, there's African Americans, Asian, and all, all these different, uh, different types and this is kind of what the world is like and the reality is that our fishbowls are so warped from what reality is so there are a billion people living in africa there half of the world lives in what would be called like extreme poverty there's half of the world lives on about less than two dollars and fifty cents a day and then and then there's over a billion people who live on less than a dollar a day um and so there's there's these like there's a lot of people who live a very, very different life than us, and we just don't think about it. It's like totally not in our minds. It's not on the news. If if something really bad happens in Africa, it could be on the front page of CNN, and no one will click on it. It's just like not – for some reason, it just goes straight over our heads. Um, but these people are some of the most incredible, uh, happiest, most joyful most amazing people that you will ever meet in your entire life or you'll ever be exposed to and when i met them i fell in love with them i thought they were i thought they were the greatest and i thought that it was so interesting that despite having so much poverty in their life they had so much joy at the same time and what and that was something that i was able to show my my mom when when my mom met this lady rosina you know it's it's a weird thing where she's like she's like meeting this lady who who has like very abusive situation lost two of her husbands and um and it's just like was homeless up until like a couple months ago and and she's just full of joy she's got like i've got this picture of this like giant smile on this lady's face and you can just it like beams through and so when you start realizing that that there's these whole this is a whole other group of people um i really i made it like my mission i was like i want people to to know about this i want them to learn about it uh and so what i did was i i created an app and the app is called Donor C, Donor S E E, and the, and what it does is, is let's say there is some girl in India who has never heard before, but she needs hearing aids, and the hearing aids cost 150 bucks. There's bone conductor hearing aids. There's uh, hundreds of thousands of deaf girls who just need 150 dollar hearing aids, and they'll be able to hear for the first time. So you say, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna use the app. I'm gonna provide a hearing aid for this for this girl, and you send the money over there, and uh, through the app, and then. You forget about it. And in most situations, most charities, you give them money and the charity disappears. The charity the charity comes back a month later and says, hey, we used your money. Trust us. Also, can we have more money? That's like the, the, That's the routine. Right, yeah. With DonorC, uh, what we do is you send money to provide hearing aids for a girl. And a couple days later, a week later, you'll get a video of that girl hearing for the very first time. Um, and a lot of times the, the the little girl will say, thank you, Robin, for helping me get hearing aids or something like that. You know, you'll get some kind of personal touch along along with that. Um, and so what, what we do is we help we help connect the dots. Whenever it's whenever you give money, you get to see exactly where it goes and you get to feel like you're making an impact because you actually are making an impact. Now, I just want to say also, just so people are clear, um, you have a website, donorsee.com, and 
And yeah. uh, you can see on this website, um, it's kind of like, uh, would it be fair to say, uh, almost like a, a kind of a Patreon for giving? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very it, similar. Yeah. So, so you. I've never heard that analogy, but that actually is great. That's fantastic. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad I have, yeah. I'm not off the mark. <laughs> um, so, so, and, the, and the, the reason I'm kind of just I want to emphasize this is uh, not only will you get to see the impact <clears throat> of uh, what you give, you're going to be able to get specific information about the specific way in which you will be specifically helping a specific individual. You'll see the picture. Exactly. You'll see what the request is. You're going to see how much um, is needed to make a difference. So it's also kind of a bit like a GoFundMe, but the projects are humanitarian projects, very specific, often at the level of individuals, obviously, who need yeah. um, particular help. So, uh, so it's great because it's the... As you said, it's about connection. So the help that you do, you get to fit, you get to experience. And, you know, I, I'm thinking of, um, you know, it's Shakespeare giving is twice blessed. What your app mm. does enables giving to be twice blessed around the world at big distances, yes. I, I would say. And, yeah, no, I, that's that's a great way of putting it. And I, the excitement that you're sharing is what I, I want people to, to see, because I think when when you start hearing it's easy to start feeling guilty or something, you know, it's easy to be like, Oh my gosh, I have all of this money. Like, why do I have so much more money than other people? Like that seems unfair. And I feel kind of guilty about that. And that's totally not, that's like totally the opposite response for like what I want people to feel. I, like we have this awesome opportunity to, to use our, our plentiful resources to, to just almost like magically, transform people's lives mm. in in huge ways right you can take someone who doesn't who's not able to walk and you can give them a wheelchair for a couple hundred bucks you can take someone who can't hear and give them hearing aids you can take someone who can't see give them glasses you can take someone who's about to die give them surgery there's so many different things that you can do and they're all if you look at the app i mean they're all like pretty small amounts of money we do some big projects we have a lady building a uh, an orphanage for she's she's trying to raise about sixty thousand, and and that's like a whole different category but that's like also a very meaningful way to make a long-term impact but like there, you can do incredible things for small amounts of money yeah. and you can kind of be i mean when you when you give money it's it's almost like you you should feel like you're like superman or something you should feel like you're doing like you're you're mm -hmm. really helping to make a real change and up until now for some reason that's not been possible whenever you give on to any other <laughs> any other website you, you kind of just feel like well whatever i'm giving because i feel obligated on donors, you get to you get to feel like, oh, I'm making an impact now. I've got to say, are. I've got to say, you know, I've for some years given to uh, Children International. It's kind of my regular yeah. one, and, sure. and one of the reasons I chose that is precisely because, in a crude way, it. it I mean, it's not even a crude way, but you know, in in a, in a significant way, it, it's it does what you're doing. Um, but yeah. what you're doing is is kind of putting it on steroids. You're kind of Uberizing uh, charity giving. Yes. Right? I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, and I love it. So how long, how long has your app been available in your site been up? How long have you actually been doing this for? Uh, so we launched the app at the end of last September. So it's been six or seven months since, since we launched. Yeah. Okay. Now, how many uh, projects, let's call them projects, but I know we're talking largely about people, mm -hmm. have, um, yeah. have been helped through your app in any way at all? Through your system, uh, through so, Yeah, I used to just like blanketly share our numbers, um, but when I used to do that, my investors would get upset with me because like okay. competition and stuff like that. So, but it's a lot. <laughs> we've, had, we've it's been very successful, now, I guess you could say. Now, hold on a second. That's interesting. When you say competition, that uh, this yeah. is fascinating. So we've only got a minute into this break uh, to, before we go into yeah. the next break. But <laughs> yeah. uh, now I'm interested. You've got investors. Is is there? Uh, there's a for profit business model here for them. Is there? Which is awesome yep. if there is. Um, there is, yeah. How and there's a very good reason for that. I don't know if there's enough time to explain it before the break, though. Uh, do you want to? <laughs> do you want to start up? We've got a minute. Do you want to introduce the, the answer? Sure. Or, okay. Yes. The answer is that the that the nonprofit world. I have my own charity uh, that I run in Malawi, where we build houses for people. The 501c3 nonprofit tax deduction world is completely broken and it's overregulated and it's impossible to do good. Um, and so I I. I had that experience and I was like, I'm not going to do it the same way twice. When I do donor C, I'm going to do it the Silicon Valley way. I'm going to make everything high tech. I am high so tech. excited. I'm just, I can't tell you. I love what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, go go on, go on. You still got half a minute. All right, yeah, yeah. So the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole concept is to create a platform that's not based off, hey, please, like, I, the, 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 the idea is to create a sustainable way to have high tech 
uh, a high tech platform for anyone anywhere in the world to be able to get money from point A to point B. I could have I could have raised money through a nonprofit, but for profit is the way to go. I'll explain why after the break. Beautiful. Yes, you will. Thank you, Greg Lyon. <laughs> we'll be back shortly. <laughs> Stairway Press is pleased to announce the publication of Robin Kerner's first book, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back. Jeffrey Tucker in the book's forward wrote, We seek to end government as we know it, but that is not the whole of what we seek. We also favor something beautiful. Explaining what this looks like and the rhetorical apparatus that necessarily accompanies this is the greatest value of Kerner's book. Barry Farber, award-winning talk show host, wrote, Robin Kerner's political, psychological, and philosophical rampage through today's America, turning on lights we didn't even know were off, takes more and more of your intellectual breath away according to how high you rated intellectually in the first place. Chris Ann Hall, constitutional attorney and educator says Robin Kerner is a defender of liberty and a true lover of America's constitutional republic the knowledge that Robin brings to his readers is sure to be instrumental in the restoration of our American foundational principles If You Can Keep It by Robin Kerner published by Stairway Press go to ifyoucankeepit.us for your pre-ordered personally signed copy Okay so Gretz uh, tell us more about doing uh, worldwide giving the Silicon Valley way and this full profit <laughs> yeah. business model. I want to know if I were an investor, what, 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 what is the business model? I mean, I, maybe there's some things you can't say about that, but in as much as you can, that's fascinating to me. The broad, the broad yeah. of it because um, I, I do want people to hear the full story. So the, the, it, last year, just in America, there was uh, – Three, there was $370 billion donated to charity. That's just American dollars going to charity. Uh, so $370 billion was given to charities. And my experience with charity, everyone, most people I talk to you can, can somewhat relate to this. My experience with charities is that, is that they're inefficient, they're wasteful, uh, and a lot, of to, a lot of times they're fraudulent. They're not transparent. The list goes on of like the negative aspects about most charities that exist right now. And I, I wish that that weren't the case. I wish I didn't have to point that out all the time. Um, but the, the truth is like charities just do a really bad job of like telling their donors what they're doing. They do a really bad job of helping a lot of times. Like I, I, I've lived in – I've lived on the side of the world where the help is supposed to be happening, and a lot of times their charities are actually hurting the communities that they're a part of. They're not helping it, um, and I've seen like warehouses full of Tom's shoes, I've, thousands of Tom's shoes sitting in boxes in warehouses on the other side of the world, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg. I could give you a million stories. Um, so the whole idea is I – when I wanted to, when I was thinking about donors, when I was thinking about how do I make an impact and how do I connect with people who like naturally just hate charities, I thought I'm going to make this not a charity. I'm just going to make this a, a for-profit business model. Everything is everything is transparent. We're showing everything on video. We don't touch any of the money besides the small fee that we take um, as it transitions from one place to the other. And our fee is smaller than GoFundMe. It's smaller than Kickstarter. So it's not like we're doing it because we're greedy. We're doing it to keep the lights on. Um, but the the whole idea is, hey, investors. When I'm talking to investors, the, the thing I'm telling them is there's $370 billion of money flowing through a broken system. We're fixing it, and we're going to disrupt the system. How would you like to be a part of that? And they seem to, they seem to want to get on board when I talk about it so, that way. So when you present um, this, you, you're saying, I guess, that <laughs> their upside is some small percentage of $370 billion. That's, that's, basic, yeah. that's your pie. And you're exactly. going, you're yeah. remaking that pie. You want to own that that space, own that pie. Yeah, a small percentage of three hundred seventy billion turns out to be a lot of money still. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm I'm almost tempted to ask you if you still want investors because I I'm going to tell you after this show <laughs> why I'm so excited about what you're doing. I I'm involved in something that relates in an unusual way to what you're doing oh, okay. and, and we'll cool, talk yeah. about it afterwards and here yeah um and so uh, well i'm you know i'm so uh you know uh, you know fear with fear of repeating myself i'm so inspired by this because um i think i mean i think you're right i think this is the way to go and and uh you know, I think we have to maybe there's a cultural issue with money and for profit versus not for profit. Right. It's yeah. like um, we still have a, a population to educate um, in the idea that, uh, you know, the, the quote selfishness of the free market has actually done more good for human welfare and can do more good for human welfare um, mm. than 
uh, then often the things that people feel more comfortable with and more immediately in their heads relate to doing good. Um, yes. and, and what you've seen with charities um, on the one hand and, you know, the, the, the warehouses full of unworn shoes, as you say, you know, um, mm. on the one hand. But also, you know, when I go to my local supermarket and see all these people getting affordably fed, <laughs> yes. right? I, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> like something wonderful about that. It's, it's very beautiful. Uh, so, OK. So where are we or where are you now with Donor C? Yeah, so let's see. We launched six months ago, and our our whole mission since we launched, our whole mission was to to, to get to hit certain milestones, get a certain number of users, a certain number of projects, and we hit all of those milestones very early on. And so we've just been we've just been developing certain certain features. There's there's two ways. There's two things that we care a lot about. The first one is trust. We want people to yeah. trust the the facilitators of of who's handling the money. Um, so we have different mechanisms for doing that we have a staff pick section um we have the video follow-ups but we want to add even more than that so you're going to start seeing some new features even over the next few weeks that are going to help you um trust the people that that you're giving through um because they're going to be able to build up their profile and just like when you buy an a blender on amazon you're able to be like oh this is from a legit person who lots of people trust we want the same thing to happen on donors where it's like oh i can read the reviews of this person i can see other people who are talking about it and that's a feature that's not built in yet but we're we're working on building that in and then the other thing that i like everyone who there's there's kind of like this weird gender gender specific thing that happens it seems like whereas a lot of uh a lot of females tend to just like they enjoy going on donor C and searching through all the projects and reading the stories and then giving to a handful of different projects and they enjoy that and they come back and they do it some of them check donor C more than they check facebook or instagram or whatever wow. um but then we have um we have guys and guys for some reason are not as into that but they still want to give they still want their money to go to the right place so we're adding a feature where they're just going to sign up to give 30 bucks a month and we're going to or or whatever amount it is and we're going to pick Mm. the projects for them every month and so they just sign up 30 bucks but we'll we'll give we'll spread that 30 dollars out over three different projects so 10 10 10 and they will they'll be like hey we we donated your money this week these were the most important projects that they went to and you're going to get follow-up over the next few days for how that money was spent so we're excited about a a few different things i I, i'm loving this now you did mention (laughs) earlier when i asked you about the investors and the business model you you mentioned um uh, almost kind of like fear of competition or you know not giving things away i guess yeah now my fear the investors i understand yeah Yeah, absolutely (laughs) now obviously though if this space gets so active that there's competition this is a a wonderful thing right in the bigger picture now i think there's no way that's not going to happen i'm just waiting mm -hmm. there's when when charities start realizing that they're losing money because they're not offering as good of a product as donor C. I think there's no they're, – they're, either charities are going to have to adapt, which is a really hard thing to imagine given how slow that they move, um, or there's going to be new competition. There's going to be new ventures that, that operate in this space. And I think that's a good thing. I think yeah. uh, I think when that happens, you know, every – Uber is better because Lyft exists. Coke is better because Pepsi exists. I think donor C is going to be better yeah. because something else comes along and makes it better. Yeah, well said. So – now that 370 billion figure is that the uh did you get that from like the total tax deductible charity giving in the united states yes okay so that most of that figure is going to the united is staying in the united states it's not leaving <laughs> yeah. right yeah I, I think the vast majority of it is actually is is it is doing that yeah. now now this is really interesting to me I, I said we would talk about this after the show but what i'm involved in is about moving um well, it's kind of about that chunk of that three hundred and seventy billion that stays in the U.S. Huh, yeah. Now, you have a platform that obviously could be we could do it on the completely different scale, right? You'll do it going global, but it would also yes. be a massively disruptive if it was extremely local. If yes. I could use your platform to give to somebody in my zip code, right? Mm. Um, I'm not, yeah. I, you know, I can't conceive the whole thing in my head right now, but but <laughs> yeah. but that would. Uh, that would have some amazing effects. Um, mm. uh, the pressure it would put on uh, government, for example, to actually be delivering quality services, targeted, mm. pro- you know. Um, yes. Where, where, how, now, so now I'm kind of getting closer to what it is that, that, I, that I do, but uh-huh. um, yeah. uh, have you thought or discussed with your team um, what it would mean to 
uh, like kind of market this as something to do exactly what you're doing for, you know, charity begins at home within the United States. Because when I was on DonorC.com, I mean, these are these fantastic projects, but they are mm-hmm. almost all around the world, outside the United yes. States. Mm-hmm. So yeah. have you, where are you with that, if anywhere? Is that something you've thought about? Yeah, so there's there's like the there's like a whole scaling, there's a whole science behind how to scale it, how to take it from from small to big. And right now there's um like the the niche that we have is these like small personal high impact projects. No one is delivering, no one is do, no charity is doing that. So we're able to say, "Hey, if you want to make a difference in someone's life in a big way for a small amount of money, donor sees the platform to do it." But as we scale over the next 2-3 years, um yeah, donor you'll see donor sees start to transform into something much broader. And so some of the local stuff is exactly what it is totally on board. And you're actually not the first person to kind of bring that up. There's people who are like, well, I live in San Francisco and I see homeless people all the time. Like, how, well, I want to do something about that. Well, I mean, we, we do too. I live in Detroit and there's all these like single mothers who are struggling. Right. Like, I want to do something about that. And, and yeah, of course, like we, we should help anyone who's in trouble, anyone who's, who's, who's suffering. That's a, that's a great idea. Now, what would happen uh, – this might be a very easy and quick answer. What would happen if an organization, let's say in Detroit, that was meeting the needs of a neighborhood? So I'm thinking, for example, there's an organization up there that is successfully policing what was a very dangerous neighborhood. And it's, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's a private organization as opposed to the government, you know, the police force. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Now, what if they came to you, maybe not now, but in the future and said, we would like to put ourselves as an organization on donacy. Yeah, so that will be okay someday. Right. Um, but the reason that we don't do it now is is just our we are so adamant about about trying to redefine charity. I get it. We're trying to get as far away from organizations as possible. I so someday when we have like a, that, yeah. a really strong when we're older than six months old and we have a really strong user culture, yeah. then charities you can come and play by our rules. But for the moment, it's like right. we don't want you guys touching our stuff because you'll ruin it. Don't mess with it. Just like you ruin yeah. everything. Else. Yeah. And and you know I really <laughs> I, I like the way you, you use the word culture there. And before you said, which is fascinating to me, that you some of your users are checking. Uh, you know, donor see maybe more than they're checking Facebook, which speaks to something that's really important here um, in, well, I mean, in all of marketing, which is really what you're doing, which is kind of tapping into the psyche in the right way, right? There's, you know, we have mm-hmm. the certain psychological components that have outlets. And yeah. um, if you can make whatever that thing is that makes us hungry for social media, maybe that sense of community. Now you're going to build a sense of community around giving, a giving community. Now that's something I don't have uh, giving to Children International, for example. I do get the letters back from uh, the, the young girl that I help or whatever, but mm-hmm. I don't have a sense of community in doing that. Now you're kind of providing that. You're kind of not. A, you're making it a bit social. Um, you're not a social, you know, it's yeah. not by social media. Well, I but mean, our, our app is listed in the store as a social media app. Oh, and that's kind of our, we, that is something that we care a lot about because everything is, is about creating connections between people. You're not, and it's not just, it's not just the, like me helping the girl who needs a wheelchair, but there's an aid worker who's every day working with that girl who's, yeah. who, who needs a wheelchair and you're developing a relationship with that aid worker as well. Um, so like, between the three of you, between the other donors who also participate in providing her a wheelchair, and then the other products she posts, I mean, the people. What we notice is that um, we have like a certain percentage of people who sign up, but then they never give. Sure. But then for the people who do sign up and they give, it's like they're hooked. It's like they start giving. We have people who have given to over ninety different projects since it. We launched six months ago, and there's people who are giving at that rate who I've never met before. They just found the site and and they want they they love the community that we've built. So yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole that's the whole idea is is building is making those connections with those all those people. Now I would imagine, um, just based on you know other work that I do, but that that. There's a probably would be a large fraction of people who sign up at any given time and haven't given yet. It's probably the majority. Would I be right about that or wrong? Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, that's correct. Okay, so it's 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 like all kind of human phenomena. It, yeah, there's this long tail, right? It's sort of the Pareto yeah. principle kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's always strange to me why people uh, sign up and don't give because it's not like, like I, I in my mind, what me me and some of my uh, my. My coworkers, my employees, we talk about this all, all the time. Like, why are people signing up but not giving? Like, you can still browse the site even if you don't sign up. So uh, it's just like a, a funny thing. But hey, if people want to sign up and just look through the site, 
that's fine. You know, I, you know, that's a great question and it bears some thinking about. Um, there's a huge difference between, there's more of a difference between not doing something at all and doing it once than there is between doing it once and doing it a million times, right? Yes. It's something, That's it's true. something yes. in one's identity, right? You're making kind of a decision almost about, uh, who you are that I'm now, this is a thing I'm now going to be doing when you go from zero to the first instance. Yes. And it's like, there, there, there's a barrier to that. I mean, I know when I, you know, when I started regularly giving to a charity, I mean, you know, there was a time in my life when I didn't do that. And there was a, then there was a time in the life, my life when I, I, I have been doing it, but, mm-hmm. but I didn't just, it took me a while. I mean, I was, yeah. and I look back now and you go, well, why? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously I, I can afford to give it. It's not like it was going to have some dangerous impact on my life, but, yeah. but it, but it is fa- fascinating. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I don't know the answers, well, I, so but the I find thing, it fascinating. The thing I'm thinking about is um, some like people think this is weird, uh, especially I guess people like my 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 peers or whatever. But like sometimes something I like to do is go to the movies by myself, like to a movie theater just by myself in the middle of the day or something. And I like doing that because it's I like I can like leave my phone at home and I can just like get away from all of my responsibilities and all of my pings and I can just like sit in a theater and like a dark theater and watch something and be completely take like distracted from everything else. It's just like it's like a very restful experience mm. for me. And I don't even go with anyone. I just go by myself. And my friends think that that's strange. And I used to think it was strange too, but then I had this friend who was like, "Great, you just got you have to go by yourself sometime. It's really fun." And I was like I I was like I don't want to. That sounds weird and socially awkward and i don't want to be i don't know if i don't know if that's i don't what if someone sees me you know you have all these questions like it'd be embarrassing if i had to explain i'm there by myself um but then one day i was like i went and i did it by myself i was like what am i afraid of what's the worst that can happen i went by myself i loved it and now i do all the time now it's like a really gratifying experience so yeah I, i totally agree with that um, I, now we've only got a minute left in this segment and it's gone really fast because I'm having so much fun talking <laughs> to you, Gret. Um, I'm interested. Do you know what kind of personality type you are? Like Myers-Briggs personality type? Yeah, I'm ENFP. ENFP. Yeah, I, 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 I could have guessed. Um, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I love this. Um, <clears throat> okay, I remember the first time I went to the cinema uh, uh-huh. on my own and I, I know oh. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about and and there you are um, small things making kind of outsized uh, psychological impacts yeah, um, yeah for real <laughs> we're, go- we're going into this uh, into the last break um, uh, uh, this is a fantastic Gret thank you so much for doing this we will be back in a few minutes I'm um, talking with Gret Glyer <laughs> If you've enjoyed this show, uh, make sure you're checking in libertytalk.fm, uh, Liberty with Love, my show that you are now listening to, runs at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, every Saturday and Sunday, and is downloadable as a podcast in the on demand section thereafter. Also, check out my Art of Political Persuasion YouTube channel to get other content. Um, so, Greg, we have a couple of minutes to, uh, you know, round this show out. Please take them to persuade. <laughs> all of my listeners to sign up to donor C and if they want to, how do they do it? Right. I, the, it, I would say there's, there's a website donor C.com. And I, I tell people, if you can avoid using the website, do it and just get the app directly. What the app does is it gives you that the most instant experience possible. So for example, the example I used earlier where, you know, you, you donate to a girl who needs hearing aids. Well, a few days later, some aid worker is going to take a video of that girl hearing for the first time and immediately afterwards, send the video and you're going to get it straight on your phone seconds after she takes that video. So it's the most instantaneous, gratifying donor experience you'll ever have. Um, I would say one thing that you can do is download the app and go follow a bunch of people. And whenever they post projects, uh, you'll get a notification. So you can follow me. I have so I have like almost 300 followers on DonorSea, and every time I post a project, all 300 people get a little a little ping saying, "Greg posts a new project. Would you like to donate to him?" Um, and I would say do that, even if you're only going to give a dollar. I don't care what you give. I don't care if you give nothing. But go ahead and look at like the different opportunities, and then also if you want, you can follow me on Twitter at Greg Glyer, G R E T G L Y E R. Yeah, just spell that again. G R E T 
G L Y E R. Yeah, it's a yeah. Because I never heard anybody called Gret before. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This has been a uh, great Gret, and and uh, you know, with this show's going, we're about to finish in half a minute or whatever. But I, I will be talking to you a little bit afterwards because I there's some sure. things I, I want to you know pick your brains and 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 all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, so again, this is Liberty with Love. Uh, my name's Robin Kerner. Um, and you know what? I, I did have an article published uh, recently at Fee Foundation of Economic Education. Check out Authoritarians to the Right of Me, Authoritarians to the Left, if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's my most comprehensive exposition of one of the biggest issues I've been speaking about on this show on and off for the last few months. And um, as always, it is a pleasure to have you with me. But most importantly, go to Don- get the Donacy app. And if you can't yes. do that, Donacy.com. Thank you, Gret. Thanks for being with me. This is my pleasure. love. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. If you appreciated this episode of Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner, then please go ahead and like it, subscribe to my channel, and maybe check out one of the other episodes like this one here.